Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to the group. For many years, I've been involved in research projects um, involving black ASI. There is a lot of variety within black ASI research across America. And we specifically focused in the region of the southern state. Historically, during the segregation period, which was a time where schools, businesses, and education were all segregated. And that included where you resided as well. And not the impact of language. So we focused on deaf people, specifically black deaf airflow users, that were segregated from white airflow users. And we wanted to study their language. We specifically focused on black deaf senior citizens who used ASL who experienced segregation at that time. And we wanted to compare that to one black ASL users and if their language was similar or different. Today I will be focusing in depth on that topic, but I will be talking a little bit about that to help you understand what my presentation is about. In 2007, I joined this research project and we've been working on it up until current day. And throughout the time that I researched, published, and the funny way that I worked, we were thinking about black ASL users, but we were thinking about the field of sign language linguistics research and black ASL users. And we know that linguistics was, um, the ASL was really, the research started in 1965 with William Stokey, and we found it that it was called and from then, we put many different topics that focus on a variety of different fields that don't have ASL research. And I wanted to focus a little bit more about deaf identity and what deaf culture meant. So what deaf culture meant. It led to a frame of what it means to be a deaf person. What does it mean to be culturally identified as a deaf person? I'm sure some of you are familiar with the word deaf person. Um, and that was kind of a response to the fact that we identity. Deafness is often focused on the clinical aspect of, or the ideology aspect of just being a deaf But we wanted to focus on the cultural deaf people, how we live and how we identify, the history, the values we have as a culture, and that's deafness. Another concept we can learn about being which is deafness. The idea that a deaf person as we have technology and have all this great information, it's not just for deaf people, but it's for everyone. For example, it's for scratching. That's a really great way for people to have access to information, but there are people who will use this scratching as well. They can use it to improve their comprehension of English and learning words. And there are elderly people in the community who are losing their hearing who benefit from the use of this scratching. Another scenario is if you were to go to the and if you're noisy and loud but you want to watch TV, you can benefit from the use of casting, which is a deaf hearing. But does the idea of being deaf and having a deaf person do a deaf person include everyone? When we think about deaf people, we think about diversity. We try to focus in on a specific population and we don't include others who should be considered as well. Like I said before, the idea of being a deaf person who identifies culturally as deaf doesn't include everyone. This book was published in 1983. The reading this book is published is not just to talk about black deaf ASI and black deaf culture, 
But I think it was a very strong response of years of frustration before the country. I'll give you an example. The National Association of Egypt is an organization that we involve deaf people politically, culturally, talks about different issues they may experience. The organization was started in the early 1900s. NAD was an organization that the black deaf community wanted to be involved with. We wanted to have a place in society and issues that we could talk about. And deaf people, deaf black anti users were not included in the NAD. Fast forward to present day. Deaf people, deaf black is when you all included in NAD, and we talk about different topics. But oftentimes, the deaf black members get issues of ignored, put on the back burner, and not addressed as much as other issues. In 1980, we decided to build an association, which is the National Black Deaf Conference. To be part of it. It's the NBDA. So now, let's focus on it. So we're so much that we still not know about the issues that affect the black deaf community. So research is done, and we know it's going to So this can include very important information on education, politics, and culture. And we need to mention Sign language is used by a black deaf community. People within the community use a different type of sign language to communicate with each other, and others who are not members notice and want to know a little bit more about it. A lot of people question why it's different, what linguistically is different about it, so we want to have part of this to respect the information. Aware of the differences in black and white And those differences were found as early as 1965. You mentioned the word because it's a language that's very common in the United States. And you have one country, and it was written by one of his best friends. And this deck is the same as it by the name of the At the time, he noticed that sign language is that the deck that can be used in the southern states was different. Now, our research was done, but there was documentation that there was a difference between the areas that are used in the black deck community and the general deck population. No research had been done, even up until 1977. There were few work published about the activities in the throughout the 1970s. In the 1980s, there was not much research done. And again, and again, a little bit of information was published, but not a lot of research was produced. In the general ASL community, there was so much more recent research and publications for ASL use within the general population. So, in Europe, I thought it was a, a big step for us in the future. We saw this specifically on the ASL use of the southern states. The more people were dedicating this study to find more data. So, what we're finding is a lot of the data is very similar to the research that has been done previously. So, we focused on and social barriers that seem to create a difference between the two sides of the community. And in this book, we focus on eight different features of the language. We focus on phonology, so we focus on two handed signs versus one handed signs. We focus on signing space whether it be forehead or lower to the area. And we know some barriers within there. We also know this variation within the size of the signing space. We 
repetition, and the same mapping and so forth. We found six major linguistic differences, and we hope to continue to find more of these things. Now that we've published this book, our work is not done. We still have much more of that kind of yes and no problem. The geographic factors and the social factors. First of all, in the gap in the 1950s, who was the even in the So there was definitely a difference in the social factors in the science communities. After that was school of education, who was the And the black community was able to attend schools with the white. A lot of people have reported being a black deaf ASL user is only for a white deaf peer and feeling really cool for the kind of ladies that know sign language because it is different. And so they abandon their own language to use the language that everyone else is using. Again, when they were in their own communities controlled by the black deaf ASL users, they would maintain the use of their own language and the differences that we have found in our research and our institutions. And this is a, a, an image of uh, us showing how the rural transfer, the rural and transfer system is going to be in the next years. And you notice that in the different years, um, language has transmitted to the West and the United States. The West Delta ASL users have very different histories. We're going to focus specifically on that because that's where we have the most different the first step school was established in 1817. The first step was not called until 1865. This was after the Civil War, and then when everyone was asked, it all black people were in the And so we do need to recognize that the history doesn't include all that people in the same way. There were a lot of different systems in the So we're not only going to focus on the discourse of air and the language itself, we are going to focus on other areas, social factors, social factors, because those are just as important. And it's important for us to think about it. And it's important for us to think about how people can adapt to it. If you meet a person for the first time and they speak the same language as you, you want to be able to communicate. How do we know if they really do what they're saying? We have a lot of assumptions based on the ways that they look, the way they dress, and the attitudes, the main assumptions that they do how they read the world, and so forth. And we also have to take into account our physical bias as an argument to so look at how we view the other person and then how they view us. I thought a lot about that, and how my identity is from whether it's intentional or unintentional, and how that can affect your interest, and what that's how it interacts with that other person. How do they show or find their memberships to other communities? How do they view each other? And how do they interpret their relationships to each other? So, again, we're not just going to focus specifically on the There's more to interactions than that. We focus on all of this when we're communicating. We focus on the identity, how we can connect to each other. We also take into consideration another person's credentials. So, for example, I'm a professor, somebody who might have 
find out but once they do find out, they may expect me. If I tell them, is it something that's easily believable? These are all things that we need to consider. And it also includes communication practice, which is really important. I'd like to provide an example that explains why this is and why it's important to recognize all of them in this system. He was very social, he was a lover, he was very much. He was with another son of hers, who was a young ASL user. And then he was just wondering, and he happened to go, you know, like, you know, like, the videos, or some, like, the or expressions, and the white flag goes and said, oh, wow, you are going to get back to the back. So what does that mean? So he was a member of the deaf community. Well, you know, he was asking if he was including his own cultural identities, specifically for black identity. It was a strong for his mind. Why is it that for deafness is not one that is as much as for that is the deaf community? So many studies focus on deaf people, but they don't focus on other cultural or other identities that may be just as important as their deaf people. So to look at somebody and recognize their deafness is deaf, he's black, he's a woman, and those things all come into play how he views the world, he's a neighbor, how they interact, and so forth. That brings us to intersection So I'll give you an example of myself. I'm going to walk up here. Another person who works here is with me, and they happen to be a white black man. There are others who don't know us, and if we ask them, who's the professor? They will notice my white black man, which is interesting. You know, we don't have to talk about it, 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 and again, we can't control how people are going to do it. So, you know, I'm going to do all the time I've got to control, as long as I can't do what I will, how I can do it, and I'm going to do it, but we will still make ourselves a space in the next meeting. So, this idea of intersectionality is very important. It could be included with our own research. In the spectrum. So, I 